in the office around, which I've a lot of you have heard me say are transparency, accessibility, and uh, being easy to work with. Um, this is really our effort that the transparency and accessibility piece. So, uh, and I think it, uh, it the the uh, value from this is reciprocal. We look to get a lot of feedback from all of you on different aspects of, of administering this program, the BEAD program, as well as hopefully we can be very helpful to all of you in terms of questions and information we share. But ultimately, again, thank you for joining. Uh, really appreciate it. We have an agenda. Uh, the agenda is going to, and I should mention, as Rachel tapped me on the shoulder, uh, virtually at least, that uh, these uh, sessions are being recorded for the sole purposes of individuals that don't have the opportunity to be uh, involved live can come back to our website and, and revisit uh, a session if, uh, if they've missed it. Um, or you all can go back and quote me on things I probably forgot I said at some point. Um, but anyways, just know it's being recorded. Uh, and I also say just in terms of structure of these, uh, this as Rachel's invitation reflected uh, is re really provider operator ISP focused. Um, we felt that having sort of like minded, like uh, interested uh, parties uh, together on a call uh, may turn out to be more productive, more useful to all of you. Uh, we will have three additional groups that uh, we uh, join each month, and the, the remaining three are the uh, nonprofit organizations, uh, the uh, cities and, and counties, and then lastly, the uh, economic development. So you're all welcome to attend any one of those. Uh, the agenda will remain consistent. However, as you can imagine, the conversation uh, is going to uh, most likely be a little bit different and more reflective of, of their interests, um, but you're all welcome to join any one of them. Um, the agenda, as I said, is going to be consistent with the exception today. We don't have a guest speaker. We kind of wanted to get our feet underneath us on some of these initial meetings, make sure they were, we were providing value, value to all of you, but we do have a number of uh, uh, um, uh, guest speakers in mind that I think can be helpful to the group as we uh, all engage and partner in this journey through BEAD. So I think with that, Rachel, if you want to uh, bring up the slide. So uh, this will be consistent across the meetings. Uh, State of the office is just an opportunity for us to give you some updates on where we are and what we've been doing with the office specifically. Um, as you can see here, we've filled six of our nine expected positions. We'd hope to have all nine of those uh, positions filled um, uh, by the end of the year, but uh, as as you all know what the uh, uh, unemployment rate is in Nebraska and is seeking out the highest quality individuals we can for the office in these positions, we've still got three remaining. Um, those three positions are two grant managers and a broadband policy analyst. The two grant managers will work with uh, Sean Donna, who I've introduced in a previous call, uh, and Diane in grant administration. And then the broadband policy analyst will work with Trevi and report into Rachel and the communications uh, external affairs office. Um, so, you know, I'd hate to pander, but if anybody knows some great people that uh, would have an interest and in, in a skill set and experience to match any of those three, we'd absolutely be open to hearing about that. Um, second thing on this component is we have fully transitioned the digital equity aspect that was previously in the CIO's office, uh, have transitioned that into the Office of Broadband. Uh, that digital equity uh, component will fall under Diane Lowe and her team. They've been doing a tremendous job of uh, that transition. Uh, for those of you familiar with the, the, you know, kind of the state, Ann Byer previously administrated that program. She uh, announced and I think finalized her retirement a week or two ago, um, but we've been kind of in front of the transition for a month, uh, several months, or at least a couple of months now. Uh, Diane's team is uh, currently working on uh, finalizing our uh, plan uh, for digital equity in the state, and um, that's due February 13th, and I think we feel pretty good about uh, the direction that's headed. And then lastly, I, I'm the state of the office. We've been monitoring a lot of legislation. We haven't taken any official positions on uh, legislation, but there are several, several broadband bills, as you, I'm sure all of you know, several broadband bills broadband related bills out there that um, uh, uh, that we're kind of monitoring and just ensuring that uh, 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 there isn't uh, what kind of impacts it may on the, have on the office and the efforts around the program. Uh, I should quickly mention too that uh, we've, at the end of this call, we intend to have a Q&A period. So if y'all don't mind, uh, we'll get through the slide deck and then we'll have an opportunity uh, to just have a conversation and, and answer any questions or, or uh, 
uh, take any feedback that you all might have. Next slide, Rachel. Um, I asked, when Rachel and I talked about putting the structure of these together, I think communications, you know, is really at the foundation of transparency and accessibility and being easy to work with. Um, so, uh, Trevi and, and Rachel, that team has been putting a lot of energy into starting to build our brand is what I call it, um, as well as create our conduits into the office as well as out to all of you. Um, so a lot of efforts in branding. Uh, we've launched our social media effort, which uh, gives me a ton of anxiety, but uh, uh, necessary these days. So you can find us on Facebook. Um, uh, Rachel and Trevi do a lot of updating there, knowing that's uh, in many cases, the primary way people uh, interact and, and get their news from us. Um, We've been doing a lot of work, and I think if you visit our website in the last couple of weeks or so, Trevi and Rachel have done some tremendous work on preparing for the challenge process itself. A lot of kind of self-guided uh, directions in terms of how to interact with the guide, um, how or how to interact with the, the portal, cha the challenge portal, what the challenge portal is, what different fields within the, within the challenge portal mean, just uh, in an effort to really prepare all of you for the opportunity to. Um, uh, interact with that portal and and do right by our state in terms of making sure we've got the most accurate map possible uh, once we close that out and uh, uh, start working towards uh, letters of interest and, and um, applications. I think you can see in this slide, Rachel points out, there is a, a, a tab within the website that's specifically for internet service providers. I think Rachel and, and Trevi have done a tremendous job of trying to understand the average uh, Nebraskan that is going to interact with, with the portal or interact through one of the eligible entities with the portal versus how internet service providers uh, uh, come into it with probably some additional experience or navigational exposure to how to walk through a, a portal of this nature. Um, uh, and we do suspect that the majority of our challenges that come in will most likely be from all of you, the operator community. Uh, so we've tried to do uh, uh, kind of create a lane for for all of you to do that, as well as you're one of the on, only eligible entities that will most likely be challenging your information, as well as being having the ability to self submit your challenges. And I think there's if you go back, there was a couple of slides up. Did I miss anything on the communication slide, Rachel? Oh, yeah, and then I, I mentioned it, but I will emphasize the website's looking really good. We've uh, the effort uh, early on to start decluttering it, not to remove any valuable or, or helpful information to you all, but organizing in a what we felt was a, a cleaner, um, more easily navigated way. If you haven't been out to it, I really encourage you to go out to it. Uh, Trevi and, and Rachel, the team has done an incredible job on, on that effort. We've still got a lot of work to do, um, uh, but uh, again, it's going to be a platform in which we expect to meet our communication goals with all of you, so uh, visit it and visit it often. Thanks, Rachel. I'm glad you went back. Yeah, I think you hit pretty much hit the highlights. Uh, I would just say under this, you know, the challenge, that's where you can find uh, on that top, that top bar kind of changed a lot. So things are, when you navigate, it's going to be a new navigation. Hopefully it's a little more friendly. So if, if you all weren't expecting to be surprised this morning uh, in this town hall, if this doesn't do it, uh, I don't know what will. Uh, this shocked me. In fact, we've spent the last several weeks uh, trying to validate these numbers just because they seem so unrealistic to me. But what you're looking at is a slide that just reflects uh, Nebraska's served, unserved, and uh, underserved and unserved numbers uh, after the release of the last FCC fabric. So you can see we right at 717,000 served, we had 29,000 uh, underserved and 50,000 unserved. The new numbers with Fabric version three or four, which whatever they're calling it, um, we're now at 773,000 uh, served residents in the state of Nebraska, residents and businesses or broadband serviceable locations, uh, just at uh, under 9,000 underserved broadband service locations in Nebraska and our unserved population has dropped to 15,000, uh, just over 15,000 and a half underserved broadband serviceable locations. Um, it, really the, the compliment and the gratitude goes uh, most directly to this group that's on this call. A lot of that progress was made 
through uh, um, enforceable commitments that you all made, particularly the EACAM effort. I think 13 of our 18 uh, ACAM regulated companies in the state uh, accepted that funding. And it just has, obviously you can see the tremendous progress that that has uh, done. I know all of you don't know all this, but I'll say it just as I, I'd want to point it out to maybe the other groups I, I'm going to speak with, and that is these not don't necessarily mean they have access to broadband right now. What it means is they'll have broadband access over the next several years. Uh, what it means for BEAD is these now are defined as um, uh, uh, we can't fund these loca the, the locations that are now sh classified or characterized as underserved or unserved. They won't be funded by bead money. But uh, on the other side of that, what that means is we're going to get a lot further in the state with the bead money we were allocated. Um, I We were, as you all know, woefully underfunded, I felt, to meet our mandate of having every broadband service or location accessed by the end of 2029. Uh, I haven't gotten to the numbers around where the, how far this gets us now yet, um, but uh, I can, there's there's no question it's going to get us a lot farther into it and, and likely into an underserved population that I never felt we'd get to. Um, so thank you to all of you. Uh, your efforts on the other side of this that uh, really has created these numbers uh, should be recognized and, and complemented by all means. We have great providers in the state of Nebraska that uh, recognize the needs of the communities they serve. And I think this is a reflection, strong, strong reflection of that. Oh, and the big news, uh, maybe not the surprise, but the previous slide, but the big news. Uh, yesterday, we received, received verbal uh, approval on our initial proposal. So once we've gotten that in, in, in written form, that will make us eligible to move on to our challenge process. But uh, congratulations to the team. Thank you all for the input and the comments that uh, you provided. I think we were complimented early on in terms of a state as having one of the cleanest volume ones uh, that they had looked at. Um, it took them some time to get through uh, their, their review of it. Um, in fact, as of not last Friday, but the Friday before that, we'd submitted our last three suggested cures and uh, again received uh, I received um, uh, the verbal approval yesterday. We were going to have our federal off, uh, federal program officer on the call today to try to explain what was taking NTI so long on, on volume one. Uh, but since we got the verbal approval, we'll bring Tom back another time to talk about a different subject. But uh, thank you all for all the, the effort and the partnership that you had in, in getting us to this pretty cool milestone. And really thanks to the, the broadband office team. So the state of the program, this will be an ongoing uh, 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 agenda element uh, where I'd like to just share where we are in the program, what's coming up, what's passed. As I talked about, we've got the verbal approval on volume one. Uh, once we've got the written that uh, qualifies us or makes us eligible to move into the challenge process, um, uh, we have um, volume two has been submitted. We've got the first round of suggested cures back. Uh, it's, uh, I haven't dove into them in details. There feels like there's a lot of them, but as I understand from the team that has gotten more, um, embedded in, and a lot of them are just not material to the concept that we were presenting or the plan, if you will, that we were presenting, but more, uh, suggestive grammar, uh, location of uh, one paragraph versus another, a lot of that. Um, but we'll, we'll dig through that and we've got a, uh, deadline of March 1 in which we have to submit uh, or response to those suggested cures. So um, online to do that. And then the challenge period itself, we had a um, long and, and at some cases tedious meeting with our vendor that created the, the challenge portal for Nebraska yesterday. Um, Rachel and Trevi and uh, Shandana, they've all been trying to break this portal for the last several weeks and, and through that found several bugs. We walked through those bugs one by one yesterday. Uh, our, our vendor believes that they can turn that around relatively quickly, uh, like in the February 10th type timeframe. So we're hoping to post on our website roughly February 12th that the uh, challenge period will open on February 15th. Um, I, I say that with a little bit of caution just because uh, we've got a lot of work to do on the portal, portal to make sure you don't deal with the frustrations, quite frankly, you, don't, you all don't have to deal with the frustrations that we have. And then there'll be a 30 day rolling clock for those uh, challenges to be submitted. As I had uh, shared in, in previous uh, public comments, uh, we suspect to run our 30 day 
uh, uh, submission window simultaneously with the rebuttal window. So as soon as a provider, for example, uh, sees a challenge come in, they don't need to wait for 30 days from now to submit the rebuttal. They can submit the rebuttal uh, when they want to. Um, and then we'll close that 30 day submission period out and that will open the 30 day rebuttal period. So you've got what we've done is really given uh, folks that are going to review challenges uh, a lot more time to do that, to, to generate the evidence that's necessary to review the, the, the category of challenge and, and to be able to pull that together and get it submitted into the portal. Actually, Patrick, if you don't mind, if I can clarify a little bit, the rolling clock actually, as soon as they're notified, it starts their clock on that challenge. Oh, oh, that's, that's a good clarification. That's a good clarification. So NTIA guidance, I'm, I really appreciate that, Rachel. That you each operator has 30 days to respond to the challenge, but we're going to let it be rolling. In other words, uh, uh, you can respond to it immediately as opposed to waiting. Uh, I guess maybe a better way to explain it. Uh, other states have taken the structure that the first 30 days will be to submit challenges. The second 30 days will be to rebut those challenges, and then the last 30 days are for us to uh, adjudicate those those rebuttals and, and challenges. So Rachel's correct. You have 30 days as a provider if you're going to challenge, uh, rebut a challenge. You have 30 days to do that from the time you receive notice of the challenges. Um, thank you, Rachel. That's a great clarification. And if it hasn't been said or you all haven't realized yet, Rachel and Trevi have taken on the challenge component uh, of, of the office for us and they've been doing a tremendous job. And so as you all you all have questions and start to uh, have exposure to the, pro, uh, to the portal that may generate a lot more questions, uh, Trevi and Rachel are really our subject matter experts on, on the challenge process. Um, I think the other thing, I'm just gonna mention one other thing, Rachel, that came to mind. Um, uh, if I think of it, I'll come back to it. <clears throat> um, so once we've gotten through the challenge process, and this is obviously a less detailed or less definitive date set, uh, but uh, in terms of the program and the, pro uh, the, the procedure we're going to lay out, uh, after we've been able to close the challenge process, submit our proposed amendments to NTIA, receive the approved amendments back from TIA, NTIA, update our map and lock in the actual number of unserved and underserved locations in Nebraska, we intend to open up a letter of interest uh, uh, window. Um, I, I, the letter of interest uh, in talking with the grant administration team, I'm really pleased with the, the thought and consideration that has gone into this. They've really embraced the tenet of being easy to work with and not being a burden or an obstacle to uh, applicants in applying. The letter of interest is going to be robust, but I think knowing that uh, a lot of the information that would otherwise be captured in an application, we're going to capture on the front end. So the applications become more about the project and less about the managerial, financial, and, and technical capabilities of the applicant. We're really going to try to front load that in the letter of interest. The, we're, we're still in discussions around this component of, of it, but for all of you to be thinking about it, we expect to ask uh, letters of interest from any applicant that's interested in any project in any round. Uh, collect all of those at the front end, review them, do the risk assessments on them, and then uh, announce eligible applicants, meaning that we've reviewed the letter of interest. Uh, it qualifies you to now be an applicant. Uh, whether you decide to apply at all or whether you're going to intend to apply round one, round two, or round three, you'll need to be an eligible entity to do any of that. So on the front end, if you're even interested in applying, it behooves you to, to do the LOI and become an eligible applicant. Applications, we expect then, will open the application window uh, late summer. And the goal I've set forward to the team is that we want to be appropriating award dollars before the end of the year. So uh, a lot in all of that, probably a lot left to learn, a lot of unknowns we haven't thought of, but that's how we've laid out our goal for 2025, is by the end of the year for the office to make an appropriations to award winners. All right, well, that's uh, that's what I had in terms of uh, kind of an agenda. Uh, we can open up for questions and answers or or feedback. We're we're very open to constructive feedback, and and that's ongoing. So if uh, we get through today and you think of some things that can be more helpful or valuable to your time, that I really respect and appreciate, uh, absolutely don't um, don't uh, uh, hesitate. I thought I just saw a question come in from Kevin Rachel. 
or maybe not a question, but a hand raise. And there's, and there's Paul. I see Paul. There we go. Good morning. Hey, Patrick. thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, Let's go with Kevin first, and then oh, Paul. I'll come to you. Thank you. Hey, Kevin. Good morning. Hi. Thank you uh, for putting this on. Looking forward to uh, participating in the process. Two, two quick questions. Um, so for e for companies that elected enhanced ACAM, and obviously we have enforceable commitments. It's a uh, pretty nuanced, you know, program. You kind of have to be in the industry to understand it. I yeah. could see folks that don't have broadband today, but have an enforceable commitment, perhaps issuing a challenge, suggesting that their location is unserved or a municipality or that. Will you automatically adjudicate those um, or will we need to take care of that on our end? So, Kevin, the way the portal set up is the provider will receive notification of a challenge uh, once the challenge is submitted. So the office will be notified as well, but we will wait for the provider to to provide rebuttal to that. Our maps reflect the uh, enforceable commitments. Um, we believe we're really confident, Kevin, that uh, we've we've gotten the enforceable commitments that are out there. But we would still expect the provider to respond to that with that rebuttal. And then the office can adjudicate it by that by reviewing our own map and saying, oh, yep, it's showing as a an e ACAM enforceable commitment. Okay. Okay. Well, and I, I may have additional questions on the, the challenge process in terms of, uh, you know, can we do some off offline, you know, is it or is any of the data going to be downloadable? Can we do some offline assessments with our own GIS tools and, you know, then re-upload? But we'll, I'll get into the nuances of that as I see it. Uh, yeah, yeah, Kevin, and, and like I said, Rachel and Trevi are, are experts in that, but to just kind of initially answer your, that, that uh, kind of question, yes, all, yes, yes, and yes. Okay, perfect. And then, uh, so as we're doing the LOIs, you mentioned financials and that type of stuff. How will confidentiality be handled? Do we need to mark that appropriately or will it be implied for kind of certain aspects of the LOI or the application process? I, I always encourage you to mark which uh, you, you want to retain confidentially, Kevin, as confidential. We will comply by that to the extent we can with our FOIA laws. In other words, we're not intending to post any of the information that's uh, considered confidential. Okay. Perfect. Um, but you. as you know, as you know, you know, being a state agency, we've got there, there's um, you know, open books laws and record, you know, open records laws out there that if we get challenged, we'll defend it. But you know, you know how that goes. Right. Okay. Thank you. But yeah, we intend to respect the confidentiality of that for sure, Kevin. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have. And as we get close to that, Kevin, just maybe if it benefits everybody, all of that is is going to reside in our in our grant administration office. So that's Diane Lowe and Shandana, who I've introduced you to. If you have any questions now that you kind of have a, a rough timeline on when that might start? It's never too early to get started on you know, preparation and getting yourself uh, positioned to be able to to be successful at that. So feel free to reach out to Diane or the grant administration office, Shandana. All right, Paul. I think you were you were next. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, one of your early slides did a comparison numerically between the old map and the new fabric map as far as served, underserved, and unserved. Right. In volume two, I think it was on page 31, there was an indication that based upon the, the uh, NTIA toolkit, there could be uh, up to a $770 million uh, delta for funding remaining even after bead was applied. Uh, First question, would the reduction in the under and unserved locations that you indicated suggest that that 700 plus number is going to decrease materially? Very much so, Paul. That's the number I haven't got to yet just because I, this is the numbers we shared on that slide, Paul, you are all the first to see it. Um, because we were so skeptical and wanted to be right because of just the dramatic change there was. Um, but so with all of that diligence and just making sure the number was as accurate as, as we were confident, as confident as it could be in the number being accurate, Paul, I haven't got to the part where now how much further do we get? I, sus I suspect, however, though, with our 405 million, I never dreamed that we would be addressing the un underserved population with any of the bead money, that we'd only get 
uh, and by the help of a lot of other enforceable commitments that we'd only get to our underserved or unserved population with B to meet our mandate. I was confident we'd do that. Um, but I really think there's a good chance we're going to get a lot further than we we were going to, Paul. Okay. Yes, I, I as, assume as much. Thank you, Patrick. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, as of right now, they haven't uh, re-looked at the fabric at the federal side and said, hey, we're coming to take some money back from you all. Yeah. Um, so I think, it, I think it is still what it is, Paul, and we'll fight to make sure that's what it is. But it's it's really going to be a tremendous value to Nebraska as, as we're going to get a lot further than we thought we were. Thank you. No, thank you. And a lot of your clients... Uh, but that EA cam was just tremendous for the state. We have one question in the chat uh, from Jennifer. With the challenge, what options does the challenger have to rebut the internal provider's answers? As an example, is placing a 30-foot pole on your house to see the tower a reasonable expectation to receive internet signal? Well, I don't know if I can answer that that example specifically, but um, the, the, there'll be uh, the opportunity for each party, the the, per, the the entity submitting the challenge, as well as the entity or entities for that matter being challenged to respond to to either the challenge itself or, or to the challenger. Ultimately, uh, adjudication will be held within this office. Uh, we'll look at the evidence presented by both parties and determine which party uh, we believe more accurately reflects, reflects um, the reality. Uh, and then, you know, maybe just to carry that out so there's there's clarity there, we then submit our adjudications to the NTIA, and they're the final adjudicator in, in, the, in the process. So let's say we hand 1,000 challenges, we be in the Nebraska broadband office hand off a thousand challenges that we upheld and believed were you know accurate in, in terms of the challengee uh we hand those off to the ntia they may come back to us and argue that uh, they don't agree with 200 of those so we're only able to amend our map with the 800 updates that uh, the ntia approved I'm, I'm not i don't feel comfortable with that probably answered the question so if, if i didn't uh, don't hesitate I, I think I can answer it a little more directly about, I think she's asking the person, so the whoever enters the challenge, the challenger, will they be able to rebut what the provider rebuts? So basically, you no, know, the process is you submit the challenge, you give your best evidence, the provider will have an opportunity then to rebut it. It does not go back to the challenger. It comes to our office to adjudicate it then. Yep. Um, now, I, I think, you know, Trevi and Rachel and I and Patrick uh, really try to focus our eye on the ball, which is the goal to have the most accurate map we can once the numbers are locked in. So the, there will be exceptions. And if we feel we need to have that conversation, I don't think we'd hesitate to do that. But, uh, you know, in, 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 I guess, standard, that's, that's how what, what Rachel just described, how we expect it to work. And one more question in the chat. Unless other anybody else has a, I don't see a hand raised. Um, how many, how may we request slash register login credentials for Vetro, the the, the challenge portal? Um, so the best way to do that is to email our office. If once you have your, assuming you have a tier D license, that is what's required for the providers to participate later in the process. Uh, so we've been recommending uh, the internet providers all get uh, a tier D license from uh, cost quest those instructions are on our website uh how to how to request the fcc number which i'm sure you guys have and then the cost quest license once those are done contact our office by email and we will coordinate those uh, coordinate the credentials from vetro being sent out yeah and i, would, I just Got reminded of what I was thinking when we were talking through the challenge process earlier. The other thing we're doing as an office to ensure that everybody has exposure, uh, the, the portal itself is designed to notify the provider uh, of the challenge, but that is driven by the challenger, right? So, and we all know that uh, they may not know there's an additional operator uh, available to them, so they choose. Uh, I don't know, operator A and so and, and not operator B, and therefore only operator A would be notified that the challenge came in. So to ensure that you all have access, we're going to post every challenge. So if, uh, you know, I think it would behoove you, the effort I, I 
uh, foresaw in this is it would behoove you to go out and look at the whole list and just make sure that uh, you're seeing all of the challenges so that, uh, you know, one that didn't get assigned to you through an outside party, uh, so therefore you're not notified by uh, you, you, you miss it. Yeah, and I, I think also they will have access to see all the challenges uh, as a rebutter in the portal as well. Yep. Yep. Um, well, from Rick Noonan to review, is the bead standard for served 25 over 3? If so, I think this is also the standard for ACAM. Uh, 25 um, and anything under 25 and 3 is considered unserved. Anything from 25 and 3 to 100 down and 20 up is considered underserved. Anything above 100 down and 20 up is considered served. So the the same definitions we've been FCC definitions we've been working with for a long time. Do you want to speak to? I know I think we caught that before about ACAM that there was an old ACAM that was 20 that showed serve at 25 3. Yeah, and I believe a lot of the EA cam is addressing those locations. Um, I don't have the numbers around those, and, and there's people far, far more uh, ed educated around A cam than I am. But you're right; there's been several past rounds of A cam uh, when the you know broadband was uh, continuing to evolve. Um, but I think EA cam is going to address a lot of those lower speed A cam funding locations uh, that that aren't currently at our definitions. In, in, oh, there's Kevin again. Sorry, I was uh, typing and thought I might not get it done in time <laughs> before. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, can you discuss how the Nebraska CPF and reverse auction areas will be handled, particularly since CPF will not be awarded until you know June fourth, I believe. They'll be they'll be uh, characterized or identified as enforceable commitments, Kevin. Well, so it'll be, they'll be awarded after the challenge process is completed. So you would remove those before you publish kind of the final list of addresses. Well, that I see what you're saying now, Kevin. So the map is going to get posted for challenge February 15th. Let's just kind of walk this out, out loud, right? Um, those CPF uh, awards are, are assigned. We can probably approach it in two ways, Kevin. Right now, we work directly with the the um, PSC to get any of their updated awards to be added to our, once they've announced, obviously, to be added and updated to our map, um, which I suspect that's the right thing to do, even if we're in the middle of an open challenge process, because either, you know, those locations are going to be identified as, as not served and we're going to, uh, 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 um, I think we want to reflect on the map as served, Kevin. It's, it's a really good question. I'd, I'd take feedback if anybody's got it on how we should handle that, considering we'll have the map posted for uh, challenge kind of simultaneously as those are being awarded. So the map will open without them, and then we just have to figure out how to make sure that map reflects them accurately. I guess, too, Kevin, if, say, for example, you all are awarded one of those CPF awards, you'd want to go in and challenge those immediately. So, so you'd submit a challenge to say they are served under an enforceable commitment. And then we uphold that challenge based on the evidence that yes, you were awarded this through the PSC. And then we go in and update the map or submit them for uh, adjudication approval through the NTIA, if that made sense. Yeah, and I'll, I mean, I think it's kind of complex and maybe I don't understand the timeline. So I'll just suggest this for your consideration or to be thinking about. Absolutely, absolutely. If the challenge process opens February 15th, and there's kind of a 30 day rolling, right? So you're looking at 60 days, you're looking at February, March, April. Theoretically, the challenge process should be done around the April timeframe, right? Yep. yep. The awards for the current round of CPF applications that are in today aren't happening until June 4th. Oh, oh, I didn't right? know that. Yeah, okay. and so I think that, you know, you know, there might have to be, I, I don't know. Uh, we. I, We'll get it fixed. I'm confident okay. we'll get it fixed, Kevin. Sure. It's, it's, yep. 
it's a little bit of an exception probably to almost every other state, um, but we'll get that fixed. Whether it's something we submit as an office back to NTIA with our own evidence that says, hey, these well, were awarded June 4th, our map needs to reflect that. Um, but we've at least if they're announced in, in June, Kevin, we'll still kind of be in that window where NTIA is still reviewing our, our data. Oh, okay. Perfect. So I think, I, I mean, it's great to know. I'm, I'm really appreciative that you brought it up because I didn't have that date in my head um, and now it's on our radar, but uh, yeah, we can all ensure that we get, we get that made correct. And for what it's worth, Indiana has the same issue. They're not doing their CPF awards until the June timeframe as well. And so, okay. you know, perhaps there'll be even broader recommendations for, you know, yeah. awards post challenge period. So thank you. Okay. Well, and I think maybe you can bring me up Rachel, but uh, uh, Tom just, uh, came into the chat to um, Kevin and Tom says, as our federal program officer says, NTIA will run another duplication before final, fi finally the, the final proposal and sub grantees are finalized. So I think they've maybe contemplated this a bit, uh, maybe not CPF funding, Kevin, but uh, uh, opportunities for changes to occur, you know, outside of the defined windows. So I think we, we'll get it. I think we're we can all work together to make sure that happens. That's a good question, and thanks for bringing it up, Kevin. Any, anybody else, Rachel or Trevi? All right. Well, again, uh, I, hopefully this was productive. It, it is for me. I, you know, Kevin, just even in the last uh, comment, uh, brought attention to something the office didn't have on the radar, and that's really what I, I hope this these this time is about. Um, so, if if uh, it didn't turn out to be that for you, please give us constructive feedback on how we can, because that's really the effort it's just to have. You know, I think you all know you can pick up the phone anytime and find any one of us on the staff in the office. Uh, but this just gives everybody, you know, a, a, a time on the calendar that says, hey, we're going to be, we're going to have that conversation with the broadband office. Uh, here, here's what I want to make sure I learn or I convey. Um, so I really appreciate uh, your time today. And uh, please don't let us uh, uh, waste it for you. I, I, I'm so respectful of your time. If this hasn't been productive, like I said, let us know. But thank you all.